What's up guys, it's Chili here. Today we are gonna talk about one of my favorite concepts that I've ever worked on. It also happens to be the first concept that I've ever worked on. It was actually the concept that started it all, the Vietnamese. Now, about a year back, I worked on a concept for the Vietnamese because I was gonna travel to Vietnam to visit some friends and I got excited about reading up on Vietnamese history and learning about uh, how the Dai Viet uh, fought all these wars of resistance against the, uh, the Mongols and then also uh, Ming Dynasty China and I was like oh wouldn't it be so cool to have like a resistance fighting force in AoE4. Um, as you guys may know uh, AoE4 is uh, is developed by Relic and Relic is a game studio that also is behind Company of Heroes. Company of Heroes is one of my favorite games of all time. One of the factions in Company of Heroes uh, I think it was I don't remember if it was Company of Heroes I think it was Company of Heroes 1. There was a faction called uh, Panzer, the Panzer Elite, I think it was called. And their whole shtick was basically traps. Like they would booby trap, set up booby traps all over uh, people's cap control points. They could, um, they, they would have mines that they could place that were really, really powerful. Uh, and I was just thinking like, it's kind of a shame that we don't have a mechanic like that in AoE 4. I felt like it worked really, really well uh, for that faction back in Company of Heroes. And just like the general concept of setting down mines uh, is, is sorely lacking in AoE 4. It's it's really cool uh, strategic play to be able to like read your opponent, know where they're going to go, uh, spend the resources to place a mine there, and then when it actually hits, you can take advantage of that moment and um, capitalize on, on, on that. I think that's a really cool uh, idea to focus, to design a civ around. Um, and I felt like reading Vietnamese history, obviously, if you guys are an American audience, you will definitely know that Vietnam has a long history of um, uh, resistance warfare. Uh, you know, we, we had we the Vietnam War where the US was trying to invade Vietnam, fight against the, um, the Viet Cong and everything, and they would uh, build tunnels and they would set up punji stick traps and all kinds of traps uh, everywhere, all, all throughout the jungle, and, and basically fight this war of attrition that ultimately they would end up winning. And if you read about the Dai Viet Wars against the Mongols and the Chinese during this time period, they fought something similar as well, uh, where where um, when they fought pitch battles with their main army against the enemy main army, they would perhaps lose, but uh, they would then slow down uh, the enemy forces by setting up traps everywhere, burning um, burning their crops, burning their houses, basically not letting their enemy uh, have any kind of um, resources to live off the earth from. Uh, basically a medieval form of scorched warfare, or scorched earth uh, doctrine warfare, uh, which is also, uh, scorched earth is also the name of the doctrine I think that um, you select as the Panzer Elite for Company of Heroes. Yeah, so uh, I think there was a couple famous battles where they actually set up these stakes that um, basically uh, forced Mongol ships to get stuck in the river and then they were able to surround the ships and destroy them. And, and by the way, I, I did do a poll last, a couple weeks ago now I think, uh, where I asked you guys which Southeast Asian faction you guys would want to see the most. And I was a little bit surprised to see that uh, the Vietnamese actually won out um, far ahead of the far ahead of the Khmer, far ahead of the Majapahit, uh, and, and the Thai, and I was pretty surprised to see that. I didn't know that there was so much um, there was so much popularity around medieval Vietnam. Yeah, it's cool. Maybe maybe there's just a lot of Vietnamese uh, listeners here or something. I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure uh, what that's all about. But in any case, I think having a faction like this is going to be super unique. Let's go ahead and dive into what this concept entails. Um, by the way, this is, uh, if you guys have seen this concept before, uh, I've actually revamped it to modernize it. I'm now a year older, a year better at AoE 4, and and I tried to design it to be a little bit spicier than what I had uh, in the past. So the Vietnamese are a faction all centered around defense, light infantry, and gunpowder. Um, and the empire uh, that they're focused on is the historical empire known as the Dai Viet, uh, or Great Viet. Um, and that started in 968 CE and ended, it, it went on for a very long time, but I think I think this year is actually a transitionary dynasty. I don't remember, I don't think this is actually the year that the Dai Viet ended up collapsing, but I don't fully remember uh, my my dates on this case. Uh, in any case, it it does a good job of encompassing the same time period that all the other factions in AoE four uh, encompass. Now, uh, this faction is all about doing a unique twist on a on a defensive faction. So the English are a defensive faction in the game. They have a lot of powers uh, around their keeps, uh, which can build units. Um, they have towers that can have that uh, network of castles buff. Uh, so a lot of raw stat based power uh, coming out of the English. Um, the Vietnamese are gonna be different. They don't have the same kind of um, 
uh, stat boosts that you'll see from other factions. Instead, they have a lot of options for asymmetrical warfare or guerrilla warfare. Basically, uh, mines, traps, and uh, poison that can slow down their enemy and weaken them through a war of attrition. That's how this faction plays. So. Uh, we'll go through their let's go through their features first uh, and then we'll go talk about strengths and weaknesses so uh, up, for, up first is the most important building here it is a unique building known as the hideout so this will replace the outpost it has less health and less line of sight so it's not as useful for scouting uh, compared to a regular outpost but it also costs less and it can stealth uh, so this means that um, if you if you want to reveal it, you either have to get really close to it uh, to the point where you know maybe it can start hitting you, and then then you can see it. Or if you have scouts or other outposts in the proximity, um, it can reveal it. The same way that uh, it works, the same the same way that stealth works for other uh, units in AOE four like the Musafati warriors. Uh, and then also very important here is that the hideout cannot add emplacements, so you can't add the springle emplacement or the bombard emplacement, which makes hideouts significantly weaker than your regular outpost, but there are a lot of big bonuses centered around the hideout uh, for this faction. Not only are they cheaper, but not only are they cheaper and they and, and they can stealth, but they also have other bonuses that we'll see uh, in just a moment. Um, now, this is a big one, influence. Uh, their influence mechanic is called resistance network. Your hideouts will emit an influence of radius one. This influence can then be chained with all the other Vietnamese structures, kind of like the Abbasid House of Wisdom, the Golden Age uh, influence mechanic. Uh, so all your all your uh, buildings can chain this influence originating from the hideout. And then what this does is that all non-siege Vietnamese units, uh, so all your infantry, all your cavalry, can now teleport across any of your hideouts that is within this network. So if you manage to chain one hideout on one side of the map, with Vietnamese buildings uh, lining up all the way to the other side of the map uh, with another hideout at the other end, you can actually teleport your units from one side to the other. Now keep in mind, this is limited by the garrison space of the hideout. So hideouts, just like regular outposts, uh, can only garrison five at a time. So you will only be able to teleport five units at a time uh, from one side to the other, uh, but it still allows you a ton of early game flexibility. If you say have villagers that are um, trying to run away, uh, they are trying to gather from a hunt uh, on the outskirts, they can get inside of a hideout and jump out and be on the other side of the map um, if you manage to set up your base correctly. Uh, same thing goes for um, if you have military units that need to move from one side of your base to the other side. Uh, uh, it, it, you can you can easily you can easily shift your military power around, especially useful in the early game. In the late game, when the armies are so much bigger, transporting five units at a time isn't going to be as significant. Although it still gives you a lot of flexibility. And this this mechanic is actually why I think um, as we're going through this concept, you'll see that the difficulty I put it at two stars. It's more like 1.5 stars for the most part. It's a relatively simplistic faction, but uh, because of this mechanic, I feel like the skill ceiling here, or is it the skill skill floor? In any case, like the, the potential for skill expression here is really, really high. If you're a really good, uh, like if you're a pro player or something like that, you could easily manage your teleporting units and it can give you a ton of advantages uh, and mobility across your base. Um, obviously, it also helps you move your villagers around faster as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential and exciting uh, benefits that you can get you can get from this mechanic here. Uh, and up next is Guerrilla Warfare. All arrows shot from garrisoned units will now deal poison damage for Vietnam. So this this functions just like Molly's poisoned arrows. It deals three damage over three seconds, and it, and the poison ignores armor. And poison can stack infinitely. Basically, exactly the same as Molly's poisoned arrows, except that Vietnam gets poisoned arrows from garrisoned units. So I mentioned earlier that the hideout um, it can stealth. So what could happen is you could have a hideout up in the front. It's stealth; people can't see it. And then when the enemy does get too close all of a sudden it's got five uh, villagers inside shooting poisoned arrows and now your unit's getting a ton of damage dealt to it and they, they didn't even see it coming. So a lot of potential power uh, in the hideout with this guerrilla warfare mechanic. And this is also reflective of history. Um, one of the main uh, tactics of the Vietnamese when they were fighting their war of resistance against the both the Mongols and the Chinese uh, was basically using poisoned arrows uh, from the jungle and basically inflicting this this attritional damage to the uh, to the to the Mongol and the Chinese armies. Um, all right, next up is conscription. Conscription's not the best name for this. I just 
kind of came up with some kind of name uh, in this case. Um, but what this does is that Vietnamese troops will gain increasing movement speed and attack speed based on the number of garrisoned villagers nearby. So this is kind of similar to um, the English network of castles where uh, your soldiers will fight a little bit harder if they are defending their homelands. Uh, in this case, if you have garrisoned villagers, then your troops will move faster and fight harder. Um, so this is obviously very good when uh, if you're getting rushed and you have a lot of villagers garrisoned inside your TC, um, each additional garrisoned villager will increase the movement speed and attack speed by some amount, uh, up to some kind of maximum. I'm not sure what exactly the number should be, so I was kind of vague here. I'm sure there can be balancing to figure out exactly how it would work. but just give you guys a vague idea. And then on top of that, this obviously synergizes with, let's say you have like a forward hideout um, and you are maybe going for some forward forward hunts or something like that. Uh, when you fight around that hideout, if you have garrison, if you have five garrison villagers in those hideouts, uh, in that hideout, or if you have, you know, 10 garrison villagers in that area, um, your, your military will fight a little bit harder in that area. So it allows you to kind of get out into the map and, uh, uh, and, and bring this bonus with you. Um, and there's some other bonuses that you'll see uh, in, elsewhere in this faction that you'll see in a, in a moment. Um, next up is Scorched Earth. Now I mentioned how the Vietnamese use Scorched Earth uh, as a tactic against the uh, invading forces. Um, so this is kind of like one of the coolest aspects of this Civ, and it's heavily inspired by um, the Panzer Elite from the Company of Heroes. Uh, villagers are able to build bamboo traps. These traps are, and I call them bamboo traps because uh, historically they would use like sharpened bamboo stakes uh, and then dig a hole in the ground hide those bamboo stakes down there this was something that was used all the way up through the uh, Vietnam War um, it's popularly known as the punji stick and punji or a punji trap uh, and that word actually comes from I think it was Malaysia I think there were British uh, I think British, during the colonial times the British forces in Malaysia would uh, face resistance fighters that would trap them with these kinds of poisoned bamboo traps um, very like very commonly used now historically speaking they uh, I couldn't find exact details on whether or not punji stick like traps were used against the Mongols and the and the Chinese in the medieval era um, but there were a few famous battles where a steel tipped uh, stakes were used to trap uh, enemy ships uh, traveling along the Vietnamese rivers. So this is kind of inspired by that. You can kind of imagine the same mechanic also having a water parallel. Uh, I don't cover any kind of naval stuff in my concepts. Um, I feel like every single faction needs to be able to stand on land by itself. So uh, you can just kind of imagine that something similar might happen on water if they end up implementing something like this. Um, anyways, the way this works is that uh, the bamboo trap, it costs 25 wood, so uh, about half of a house. And Traps are stealthed, uh, so they can only be revealed with scouts and outposts, or they are revealed when you get way too close to them. Um, or I think in this case, it won't get revealed until you step on it. Uh, they provide vision of the immediate area, and the moment that they trigger is when they get stepped on by, by an enemy. It'll sound an alert. Uh, all players will hear this alert, and after a brief delay, the trap will detonate. Uh, it, this will reveal the area, it will deal damage, it will apply poison to everyone there, and it will stun uh, those nearby enemy units. So a lot of potential for like setting up an ambush or something like that where um, you, you have these traps set up in these key choke points. When an enemy arrives there, uh, your units can uh, retaliate after they step on the trap. If they get stunned, now your units can jump on them and take advantage of the fact that they're stunned. Uh, the stunning works similarly to how knights get stunned when they uh, hit a spear brace. Um, so they won't be able to move, they won't be able to attack, uh, and it potentially leaves them in a very vulnerable vulnerable position. So this also, I think, offers a lot of cool opportunity to mind game the opponent as well. Let's say, for instance, the Vietnamese player actually like leaves gaps in uh, or holes in their walls. Um, and, you know, normally uh, m when playing against any other faction, you would just think, oh, cool, there's a gap in their wall, I can just run right through it. But in this case, uh, if you have a gap in your wall, the um, the trap might detonate. Uh, there might be a trap there, and if you go in there, uh, it might detonate and 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 and, tr and put you in a very very uh, bad situation. So some players might be hesitant to even go through the holes in your walls, and the Vietnamese player can kind of play these mind games with the enemy, even if they didn't spend the wood. Uh, that there could be an invisible trap there that is in the enemy's head, which I think is a really exciting uh, strategic opportunity. All right, uh, next up is Rice Terrace. 
the rice terrace, uh, this will replace the farm. I used to call this Champa rice paddy, um, but I'm changing the name because uh, the Cham were, so historically speaking, uh, the Cham were a uh, their own uh, ethnic group. They were uh, their own polity. They, they were a kingdom in the southern half of what is modern day Vietnam. Uh, they were a rival kingdom to the Dai Viet and they fought numerous and numerous wars uh, back and forth against each other. Um, and uh, the Cham were known historically for uh, they had this very unique strain of rice uh, that was popularly known as Champa rice. Uh, it was this was it was this was the rice that was uh, gifted to China, I think, during the Tang Dynasty, actually, um, or maybe the Song Dynasty. I don't fully remember there, but uh, they 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 gifted the rice to China, and then this allowed China to uh, uh, basically change up their farming techniques because the rice was so much more efficient to produce, and this allowed for a huge population boom in China. Um, so. I wanted to give some kind of reference to that in the era of the Dai Viet, especially in the later uh, half of the medieval period, um, after Vietnam uh, su suffered its invasions of um, of the Mongols and of the Ming Dynasty, uh, Vietnam ha had a very powerful military and they learned a lot about gunpowder weapons in their fights against China and using their gunpowder advantages they were able to eventually topple the Cham uh, kingdoms and basically um, uh, end their their uh, their timeless rivalry uh, because the Cham did not have access to gunpowder weapons but the Vietnamese did um, and so ultimately by the end of this period, uh, the Cham would be conquered and uh, much of Vietnam as we know it today uh, would be established, um, at least ter territorial spe territorially speaking. Uh, so in this case, uh, I I'm changing the name because it is technically a different ethnic group and I don't want to directly reference it, but you can imagine this as a inspired by the idea of Champa rice. Uh, on top of that, Vietnam just has very, very beautiful rice terraces all over the place. It's a relatively, there is some mountainous terrain and they had to figure out how to farm in, in those situations. So the rice terrace, it replaces the farm, it costs more, and it requires four times as much space. So it's a very, very large farm. It's basically uh, two two times as long, two times as, two times as wide, two times as uh, tall or long, um, and, but it also gathers twice as fast. So what this means is that your farming transition as the Vietnamese is going to be pretty damn painful. You need a lot of territory to cover and you need a lot of wood uh, to make that transition. But once you do make that transition, you actually don't need too many villagers on farms. Uh, so you are able to um, uh, reap your rewards of your farming a lot faster compared to other other civilizations. It just gives you something more to think about and it forces, um, it, it has the added benefit of when the enemy is trying to raid your farms, your farms is not are not as dense as regular farms, so there the number of villagers that you can potentially raid here is going to be a lot less as well. But this also means that the Vietnamese player will have to uh, defend more territory. So there's a bit of a trade-off here, and I think it makes the uh, it makes your gameplay decisions a little bit more interesting with this faction. Um, up next is worker elephants. Worker elephants are mobile universal resource drop-offs and they can be trained from the town center in the dark age so this this works kind of like the um the wagon uh or, or the ox cart i think it's called from age of mythology where it's a it's like an animal unit that you can move around and then resources can be dropped off there now this unit is a, admittedly a little bit tacked on to this design i don't necessarily love it it was actually um i think I think after I posted my Kumer video, uh, someone was talking about how it'd be cool to uh, have worker elephants uh, added into the game. Um, and I was thinking like, oh man, that is a good point. Like it would make a lot of sense for the Khmer to have like a worker elephant type unit. Um, and But I already posted that video for the Khmer. So I was like, is, is there a way I can incorporate incorporate worker elephants into, an, into another civilization? Uh, the Vietnamese were the next best option. Um, so. In this case, you can think of it as like, this could work for Vietnam, this could work for the Khmer. It's just a really neat idea to add like this universal resource drop-off uh, mechanic. And also worker elephants, of course, can be used as rams, potentially like a poor man's or like a cheaper, weaker version of a ram if you really need it to um, when you're doing like a dark age or uh, a feudal age uh, kind of a, uh, attack. Um, all right, so those are the uh, core mechanics of this sieve. Uh, the unique units here are the worker elephant, the arquebusier, and this elite palace elephant. And we'll talk about what all of those do in just a moment. Um, so overall, with the strengths and weaknesses of this faction, it's got really, really strong light infantry. So their spears, their archers, their crossbows, and their hand cannoneers 
all those guys are really, really strong uh, with this faction. Uh, great for moving around quickly and fighting in guerrilla tactics. Uh, they have a lot of strong defenses with garrison villagers who can shoot poison arrows. They have traps that provide vision and can stall the enemy with these uh, stuns and, dam and, and poison and, uh, and damage bursts. And they have the, the hideout network mobility where you can jump from one hideout and teleport to the other side, uh, kind of representing the, um, the tunnel system that was used in Vietnam. Now, the tunnel system uh, that we popularly know it today um, uh, is, 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 is a result of a very unique and specific situation related to the Vietnam War with America. Um, but uh, historically speaking, uh, Vietnam does have a lot of terrain that is very uh, moldable uh, with, uh, I think it was specifically like the, the Vietnamese were able to use these tunnels because the ground was made of uh, a certain type of clay that was very easy to dig through and mold uh, and also held up uh, and didn't wouldn't just collapse on itself. Uh, I think this kind of terrain was actually all, regularly used even back in the medieval era uh, tunnels were used as a defensive measure against uh, invading forces so this is kind of a reference to that uh, of course the vietnamese are not unique in using uh, tunnel systems to uh, do defenses uh, famously um uh in 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 in, in turkey there is a uh, there's a tunnel system th there's various tunnel societies in Cappadocia uh, I got a chance to visit that uh, last year actually um, uh, where uh, the Byzantines were uh, the Byzantine Greeks would basically retreat into these tunnels to defend themselves against invading uh, Turks um, uh, I think it was Seljuks at the time um, and so they they made societies and whole cities in these in these tunnel networks and and also defended themselves through that so this is kind of a thing that you'll see in a lot of uh, societies um, but I felt like this kind of mechanic worked really well with this sieve and fit with the theme of like a resistance fighting, a resistance force kind of uh, civilization theme. Um, all right, so for their weaknesses, uh, obviously uh, they are weak to any unit that can counter stealth. So scouts, outposts, the home TC. Uh, their hideouts are weaker than regular outposts. They aren't able to add emplacements to them. Um, the farm transition is pretty expensive and requires a lot of uh, open space to control, uh, and they are very wood reliant. As, as seen earlier, um, they their farms are expensive. Light infantry uh, needs a lot of wood, um, so they're and 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 you know if they want to get their hideouts out, they also need to gather a lot of wood. So it's a very wood reliant civilization. Uh, all right, let's take a look at their units here. In the barracks, we have the spearmen and the man at arms. Now. Uh, these are pretty standard units, but um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the light units in this faction are pretty damn good. And the way that we make spearmen better here is this technology in the, available in the Castle Age known as the Anam Fire Lances. So it functions something like this. Uh, just like with China, Vietnam also had access to Fire Lance technology. In fact, Vietnam was known as one of the uh, inventors of uh, a lot of gunpowder technologies that we popularly know today. Uh, some of the um, best invent, some of the best um, uh, uh, in inventors for ch that worked for China uh, actually came from Vietnam, uh, and they would end up uh, being cap. They would end up be captured by uh, the Chinese in and uh, forced to work on uh, gunpowder projects for them as well. Um, so the Fire Lance, in this case, is going to work very similarly to the Chinese Fire Lances, uh, which currently is like a horseman unit that, um, upon charging, their lance explodes and it deals AoE damage. In this case, the spearmen, uh, Vietnamese spearmen, will have explosive tips that also detonate on charge or on brace. So a really good unit, uh, a, a really good way to make spearmen a lot more relevant against, say, uh, massed enemy infantry or um, it, it, and even more potent against uh, enemy uh, cavalry charges, especially when uh, uh, when it's a mass cavalry charge. Um, their men at arms are going to be pretty standard. Um, Vietnamese men at arms. I, I did a lot of looking around to see what like a Vietnamese armored warrior looks like, uh, and I, time and time again, I got this like image of like a like this badass looking armored warrior with this tiger pelt uh like hanging over them this is such a cool design and i would just love to like you can obviously imagine like this fits so perfectly as the uh imperial age elite men at arms uh, aesthetic for the vietnamese uh you can imagine this like tiger pelt being a little bit more golden just to represent the elite status of this of the soldier uh in the imperial age and yeah it just it looks so cool like you gotta have something like this um uh, there's no other unit that looks like this in the game right now.
now. I, I guess like the, the Ottoman Sapahi, uh, they have, the horse wears a, a lion pelt, actually. I don't if you zoom in on it, it's actually, it actually looks pretty, pretty baller as well, but I'm hoping that we can get like a like a Vietnamese man at arms that looks really really cool with this like tiger pelt thing. Um, although uh, it's it's a little bit sad that uh, there's so many tigers had to be hunted to to create this kind of look. Um, all right, up next is the stables. Let's take a look at this. Uh, the Vietnamese uh, historically they were not known for their horses. Uh, they were not known for for their cavalry, but cavalry did exist. Um, and there, we do have archaeological evidence for it. Um, in fact, uh, these designs for uh, Vietnamese lancer type unit, uh, obviously it looks very similar to what a Chinese lancer might look like. It'll have like a Guandao type of weapon. Um, this helmet design is actually uh, based on archaeological findings. I think, I think this creator um, uh, literally used the archaeological version uh, here. Yeah, so this is the archaeological uh, finding here. We see this design with this face mask. Uh, I think it looks really badass. Uh, so uh, I would love to see this represented in game. Uh, here's an example of what the horse barding might look like. Um, just a really cool concept and not something that we currently see. That being said, uh, uh, the Vietnamese were not known for having particularly good cavalry, so the cavalry will be there. They'll be pretty basic, um, but uh, they won't be a standout unit within this faction. Um, I think previously in my design for the Vietnamese, I actually didn't have the Lancer and I had some kind of elephant type of unit here. I wanted to de-emphasize the role of elephants in Vietnamese warfare. Vietnam did use elephants way more compared to say China did, but uh, compared to some of the other elephant heavy factions, Vietnam's use of elephants is not as... Um, not as focused upon. Uh, so uh, I wanted to keep it a little bit more basic and just give them a Lancer. Whether or not the Vietnamese had strong Lancers, um, I'll give them a Lancer unit. Same way like, you know, the game gave the Japanese mounted samurai, even though the Japanese didn't have uh, heavy cavalry traditionally. Um, uh, just This is just a way to like keep the game a little bit more simple uh, in the balance. Um, yeah, and I, and I just love the way the Vietnamese armors look. This, this, this picture comes from Humankind, uh, which is a Civ competitor that I really like. Um, and you can see the this like these distinct armor patterns with this like spiral chest plate design, really cool. Uh, oh yeah, and there was also some uh, when I was looking around for reference photos, I found a lot of amazing artwork. Uh, this I think a lot of these are by this guy named Cal Viet. Uh, found an art station, and yeah, there's all these like really cool, really cool looking armor sets. Vietnamese cavalry, infantry, you can see this like, here's this tiger heavy infantry motif again. Uh, both of these guys are actually carrying, uh, wearing the tiger pelts. Um, and yeah, and v uh, elephants were used in Vietnamese warfare, but uh, maybe not as heavily compared to some of the other civilizations. Uh, all right, um, moving on to the archery range. All right, so this is where things get interesting. Uh, the Vietnamese will have very strong light infantry, and obviously every single infantry, obviously every single unit within the archer range is a light infantry unit. So archer available in H2, pretty standard. The crossbowman available in H3, pretty standard. Now, in, also available in H3 is this technology known as rattan shields. It adds plus one, plus one armor, so plus one melee and plus one ranged armor for all ranged infantry. And this includes the Arquebusier. So uh, the Arquebusier is going to be their H4 uh, hand cannon ear replacement, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But uh, the Rattan Shields technology is a reference to the, the Rattan Shields used by uh, some many East Asian warriors, actually. Uh, it was actually more prominently used, I think, in China, uh, as well as in Korea compared to Vietnam. So Vietnam's not necessarily uniquely known for using rattan shields. But that being said, uh, back in AOE 2, the unique unit for the Vietnamese was the rattan shield archer, um, which looks like this. I don't know why they decided to make the Vietnamese unique unit a rattan shield archer. I felt like that was lacking a little bit of flavor, actually. But since that unit does exist. I wanted to make a reference to it, um, and we don't really see rattan shields being used elsewhere in the game just yet, so uh, might as well include it here. Now, what the rattan shields did historically was they were very strong, they were very sturdy, they uh, were sometimes known to be bullet resistant even, um, and they were uh, they, they 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 were uh, what's the word? Um, they lasted very long, uh, even in the environments, the 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 wet environment of the jungle. Um, so. Uh, a lot of flexibility with that, and I think it would be a cool technology to add into the game, which gives your archers and crosswomen and your arquebusiers a lot of flexibility. 
All right, let's talk about the, uh, actually, um, just imagine like if you get charged by a group of men-at-arms with your crosswoman, your crosswoman can tank a few more hits from the men-at-arms, which I think is uh, gonna be a really, really good advantage for you guys. Uh, next, we'll talk about the Arquebusier. Uh, this is the hand cannoneer replacement. Uh, it is more food expensive, uh, and what's unique about this, this type of unit is that their shots penetrate and also damage the targets behind their units as well. Uh, be, sorry, damage the units behind their target as well. So the Jiaochi Arquebus uh, was famous in this period for being the best Arquebus in all the land. Uh, arguably even better than the European uh, imported muskets that were being used. Uh, Ming China basically really, really liked these uh, guns and sought heavily to import these guns. Uh, they were known to be, have a lot of penetrating power um, and even penetrate multiple targets at a time. So that's where this mechanic comes from. Uh, I think uh, if I read, read correctly, the reason why this Arquebus was so powerful was because of a special type of wadding that they would use that was extracted from uh, a gum that's unique to the jungles. Um, and because of that, because of that wadding, it gave additional power to this to this uh, to this Arquebus. So um, the Arquebusier will be a unique unit for the Vietnamese, making the Vietnamese very very powerful in in late game gunpowder battles. Um, and the fact that they can penetrate and damage multiple units at a time uh, make, gives them a slight AOE damaging uh, advantage against, say. Um, the natural counter to Archibuzers might be like a masked archer comp, uh, but if the Archibuzer is able to penetrate multiple archers uh, to deal damage, it could be quite devastating on the enemy archers. So uh, I think this is a potentially a very, very, very busted unit. Uh, obviously, I'm not saying anything about the balancing of the stats or anything like that, so uh, it might need to be balanced uh, accordingly. Uh, and for the Siege Workshop, uh, we'll, we'll have a very standard Siege roster, uh, but I'm also adding the uh, existence, the, the option of the Culverin. Uh, not, every, not every faction gets access to the Culverin, but in this case, I felt like it was appropriate since um, Light Infantry is Vietnam's specialty, so Manganels would be a great hard counter to this faction. The Culverin just gives the Vietnamese a little bit more optionality in the late game, um, and uh, since Vietnam is going to be a gunpowder-focused faction, giving them the Culverin I felt like was appropriate to uh, emphasize that a little bit. Um, I have some pictures here. Uh, these are these are some really cool cartoon cartoon uh, like cutesy depictions of uh, what Vietnamese infantry look like. Obviously, you see the the tiger uh, pelt motif again. Um, we see these like kind of box shaped hats. Uh, different kinds of like hand cannoneer type of units, um, various kinds of Vietnamese armor, uh, really cool stuff. Uh, you could even have a Vietnamese grenadier, but since you know China already has a grenadier uh, unit in AOE4, I didn't want to uh, overlap too much in this case. Um, and here's some uh, museum evidence of uh, hand, can hand cannons used by the Vietnamese uh, or used by the Dai Viet. Uh, all right, so next up is additional units, structures, and technologies. Uh, I mentioned the Worker Elephant, which was available in the Dark Age, uh, just a universal resource drop-off that, that you can move around. Uh, the and obviously that synergizes well with you know if you have forward villagers that are building outposts or, or sorry building hideouts, uh, you can also have the elephant kind of move with them and gather resources and just kind of spread across the map. I'm imagining this faction is like you you want to spread out across the map and just kind of like hide in the woods and like play very sneakily uh, while you're like secretly building all over the place, um, which I think is a really cool identity that's currently not in the game. Uh, the hideout is the cheaper outpost I mentioned earlier. Uh, the bamboo trap is another structure, the 25 wood and the triggers and it deals damage to enemy units. Uh, and then we'll talk about Elite Palace Elephant later because this is attached to a landmark. And the rice terrace we talked about is the bigger farm. Now let's talk about the technologies here. The monetary reform technology available in H2. Now. This is inspired by uh, AOE 2. They had a technology called paper money. Uh, now, Vietnam was famous for instituting a policy of paper money um, in their kingdom, but they were not unique in instituting paper money. In fact, uh, China was inst had instituted paper money before them, so it didn't quite make sense to give Vietnam this unique technology called paper money. Instead, uh, it makes more sense to call it monetary reform because the reason why Vietnam uh, instituted this policy of 
paper money was because they wanted to take the uh, the metals from the coins to melt down and create guns from them. Uh, so that required a whole kind of monetary, well, reform, uh, and uh, eventually paper money became the norm in, in, in Vietnam. Uh, now, just like with the uh, bonus that you had in AoE 2, uh, it basically gives you a little bit of a gold when you're also gathering wood. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Vietnam is going to be a very wood-hungry faction, so getting some of that gold as well uh, synergizes pretty well with uh, what this faction wants. And the fact that this is available in H2 makes the Vietnamese economy very distinct from, from, a, from the get-go. Sorry, just drinking some water there. Um, all right, up next is Empty Gardens. This is a reference to, uh, I think it's called Empty Houses, Empty Gardens. There's a speech given to given by the uh, one of the Vietnamese generals. Um, I forgot, uh, I forgot his name. Uh, basically, when the Mongols invaded, the general had this speech uh, where he called out for uh, the gardens and the houses to be emptied. Uh, basically symbolizing uh, uh, scorched earth warfare. Uh, basically, when the Mongols arrive, uh, there will be nothing for them. Uh, they might take the city, uh, they might take the land that the city's on, but there's nothing in the city that they can actually extract any kind of uh, benefit from. No food, no no gold, no wealth, uh, nothing usable. Uh, and so this is kind of a reference to that, and it kind of fits in with the identity of Vietnam being a attritionally diff attrit defense through attrition kind of uh, faction. So in this case, your destroyed structures will return a small portion of their cost after being destroyed. So uh, in this case, yeah, Vietnam, you, even if you push into them, they're, they're, they're more okay than, than other factions are with accepting the loss of some buildings, um, which, yeah, I think it fits well with the Civs uh, theme. Uh, and then in H4, uh, they get access to this technology known as explosive traps. So instead of just bamboo traps, you now have explosive traps, which will affect a larger area and deal a lot more damage. So it's basically just a mine. Uh, when the enemy steps on it, uh, there'll be still be a delay, but then now uh, after the delay, it will explode and just damage all the units around it. And it doesn't apply poison anymore, but it does a ton more damage. Obviously, this is much more effective against armored uh, units. And the history behind this is, this is a little bit rule of cool here. Now, mines were used since the medieval era, um, but uh, the only documented uh, uses of mines that I could find were actually in China. I think there was a famous battle. Uh, it was actually in in the game, the Siege of Zhongdu. Uh, basically, when when the Mongols were sieging Beijing at the time under the Jin, which was at the time under ruled ruled under the Jin Dynasty, um, there was a, a evidence of like a great explosion that happened uh, after the Mongols basically triggered a Chinese mine uh, or Jin Dynasty mine rather. Uh, so mines did exist in this medieval context, so uh, it's not too crazy to imagine that Vietnam might also be able to build mines, especially considering that there were so many talented um, uh, 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 gunpowder experts in Vietnam. But I couldn't find any exact evidence of mines being used by Vietnam, but I felt like it fit so well with this faction's uh, design archetype that I, I felt it important to include here. Um, so it's just a, a buff to the, the way the traps work. Uh, all right, looking at the landmarks now. Uh, in the feudal age, one pillar pagoda. Uh, this is a very famous uh, landmark in Vietnam. Uh, very famous piece of architecture from the, the Dai Viet Empire. Uh, it functions as a hideout, and it also allows hideouts to train all light infantry at a slow rate. So this means that uh, you can train spearmen, archers, crosswomen and archibuziers in later ages when you unlock them uh, from all of your hideouts. But your hideouts will train them slower, like let's say, um, you know, 50% as fast compared to like training them from a barracks. Uh, so this does allow you to forego building barracks and archery ranges. It gives you a lot of flexibility in the early game to uh, build what you want to build. Your opponent can't necessarily read it, but I mean, once they see this landmark, they'll know that, um, you know, your forward, uh, if you built a forward hideout, let's say you tower rush someone uh, with the hideout, uh, you can now train, start training units from there. So there's a lot of potential early game tempo power from unlocking this landmark. Uh, it doesn't transition as well into later games, but it does give you a lot of uh, options for training a lot of units early on. Uh, the other landmark is called Resistance Headquarters. This provides a large vision radius, and it slowly generates tickets that allow you to place self-building bamboo traps in a large area. 
Uh, so and you begin with a few tickets already in stock. So this is a great defensive landmark. Um, you can pl it, it will automatically place traps. Uh, as you, you get tickets and you can automatically select where you want the traps to get placed. Uh, this might be great for enabling like um, like a defensive boom. Let's say you wanted to go 2TC, you can use this landmark to basically defend you while you're doing that. Uh, so there's a lot of pot great defensive potential here. This might even be underpowered depending on how how many or how few bamboo traps you can get or how large the area you can influence is. Uh, but you know that's up to the that's up to the how the game gets balanced. Uh, up next is Imperial Citadel. This will function as a keep and it will improve the gathering rate of rice uh, in uh, in the terraces nearby by 50%. So if you build this thing, you want to build your rice terraces around it. Uh, pretty straightforward, um, obviously great for defense, uh, but also great for boosting your economy at the same time. Uh, the other one is the Fu Min Pagoda. Your first 10 hideouts will automatically train a free villager. So the moment you finish building this landmark, if you already had 10 hideouts on the map, uh, all 10 hideouts will now instantly queue up a free villager that you can then use to you know do whatever you want with your economy. And then it also functions as a monastery. Obviously, this is incredible for giving you a huge boost. Let's say you did a lot of early game shenanigans here, and then you uh, wanted to transition into a boom in the mid game. Uh, this immediately allows you to transition that very quickly. Obviously, it doesn't have as much late game potential as say this, where you know in, in the super late game, having even better farms might be better. Uh, but here, being able to get that tempo back is I think humongous. It just requires you to build hideouts, and remember, hideouts are only 75 wood a piece, so it's a very, very resource efficient uh, way to boost your economy. This might be OP. Um, obviously, the numbers, like, it doesn't have to be 10 hideouts, it could be 5 hideouts or 8 hideouts or something like that. Um, that all depends on the balancing. And in H4, we have the Imperial Garden which can train elite palace elephants. Now, this is uh, interesting. Uh, uh, palace elephants are tankier elephants that can garrison up to three units. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of bonuses around garrisoning, garrisoning units with this faction. Uh, the uh, uh, When you garrison units, uh, they get poisoned arrows. Uh, so when you garrison, let's say, like, you know, three spearmen or three villagers into this palace elephant, this palace elephant will be shooting poison arrows, right? Uh, but in this case, it's actually a little bit different. The units that are garrisoned inside will actually be shooting unique rocket weapons. Uh, so this is kind of a rule of cool uh, idea. Now, the Vietnamese did have access to rocket, te rocket technology, uh, like the fire lance or the fire arrow, uh, the same way that China did. Um, so I wanted to make some kind of reference to that here. Uh, there is no evidence of a rocket elephant in history, so this is purely just a rule of cool, wouldn't this be sick kind of uh, unit. So uh, you can imagine, like, this is a, obviously a very expensive unit. Uh, it's even more expensive in that you need a garrison, you need to sacrifice three additional units to put inside, so it takes up a lot of potential pop space. But because of that, the benefit is that they shoot rocket weapons which are very powerful they might not be as strong as like say the japanese shogunate castle rockets um but maybe somewhere in between that and the nest of bees rockets so i'm not sure exactly how that'll work but i think the visual of just having this like towering elephant maybe it's even painted in white uh and it's marching towards you and it's shooting out ro three rockets at a time um i think that would be such a such, such a cool uh, type of unit that i felt like it was uh worthy of including in this concept now yeah, it, it is not really historical though, uh, and I I will I'll be the first to admit that. Um, uh, and and keep in mind uh, when if you garrison three villagers inside, you also get the ability. It also synergizes with this con conscription ability. So Vietnamese troops gain increasing movement speed and attack speed based on the number of garrison villagers nearby. So when they're when villagers are garrisoned garrison inside of the elite palace elephant, it still counts as a garrisoned unit. Um, and if you had like you know three of these with nine villagers garrisoned inside, you could give a lot of uh, uh, potential. Uh, uh, attack speed and movement speed buffs to your nearby troops, which is makes it a great offensive uh, unit in the late game. Um, and lastly is Trung Foundries. Now, uh, Trung was the name of the um, very famous uh, uh, gunpowder, you know, wizard. I guess he's a gunpowder expert from that time period. I forgot. I forgot his full name. I think he was actually like a Vietnamese prince or something like that. But um, he was 
basically responsible for developing a lot of really amazing uh, gunpowder technologies for Vietnam and I think he actually ended up getting captured and recruited by the Chinese and then ended up building uh, gunpowder weapons for the Chinese afterwards. Um, so this is kind of a reference to uh, his contributions and we haven't had a building called foundries yet in the game so I felt like that would be appropriate here as well. Uh, what this does is it gives gunpowder units and upgrades for gunpowder units uh, 15 they make it makes them 15 percent cheaper so instead and uh so, so so this is great for you know if you want to spam hand cannoneers or in this case the arquebusiers uh if you want to spam bombards um if you want to spam explosive traps all of these would synergize well with this uh now the other big bigger thing here is instead of poisoned arrows your garrisoned units will now shoot guns dealing much more damage so you can kind of imagine this as being similar to the uh, Red Palace for the French. Uh, the Red Palace shoots these arbalist bolts uh, instead of regular arrows, uh, which deal a ton of damage and just basically mow down enemy units like a machine gun. Um, and fr it also gives French town centers the arbalist uh, emplacement, uh, allowing French town centers to uh, deal a ton of damage as well. This functions a little bit similarly, where instead of shooting poisoned arrows now, your units just shoot guns, which makes them much more effective against armored units, and uh, essentially allows, um, you know, if you have units garrisoned in a keep, and the enemy's just trying to uh, attack your keep, your your keep will shoot 15 gunpowder weapons at a time. Um, and you can also imagine it working similarly to how the, um, you know, like the Chinese town center shoots uh, a gunpowder, uh, a gunshot. Um, or has a gun slit in placement for their outposts. Uh, it might be something similar to that, but just imagine 15 of those shooting at a time if you have 15 uh, villagers uh, garrisoned inside. So potentially very, very powerful. Uh, a great defensive uh, bonus here. Um, I don't think it's OP personally because there are other H4 landmarks that kind of function in a similar way. Um, but yeah, uh, it gives you a ton of benefits in the late game, obviously. If you if you build four hideouts on the enemy base and just garrison them and garrison them uh, with villagers, uh, you could deal a ton of damage. Uh, all right, and lastly for the wonder, uh, this is a uh, the Boot Top Temple. I have no idea how to pronounce Vietnamese. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, it is a 13th century Buddhist temple. Uh, it has this... Uh, Avalo Avalokitesvara statue, uh, basically a, a like a Buddhist type of statue. Uh, it has a thousand eyes and a thousand arms. I think this is it. I tried to find picture references to it. And I think this is the best I could find, um, which is a, apparently a, a particularly large statue. Uh, and this temple houses it, and it was also the wonder for uh, the Vietnamese in AOE too. So I thought it was fine to just kind of make another reference to it here. Uh, alright, that was, uh, that was it. I wonder if there's anything else I wanted to talk about here. I'll just show you some more reference images I was looking at. Um, oh, here's another example of an artist's rendition of the, uh, either the Jiao Chi Archibus, uh, which is like, like the hand can, hand cannon. In this case, the artist interpreted it as a hand cannon that shot multiple arrow bolts, uh, instead of, uh, like a, like a, like a bullet gun. Um, this could also be an interpretation of the Fire Lance, maybe. Uh, that kind of shoots multiple air bolts. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and he here's a representation of much later, like this is like 1700s, 1800s era, uh, Vietnamese war elephant with um, a cannon uh, emplacement on the back. Um, kind of, you can imagine it as like, sort of like what the rocket elephant is referencing. Um, the potential of using gunpowder weapons on top of an elephant's back. Uh, let's see what else here. Uh, you can see various designs for um, Vietnamese uh, arquebusiers. They all have this kind of like rice hat looking design. Um, these are from I think the Taesan dynasty, basically a much later dynasty from uh, the di from what we're looking at. Uh, but you can kind of still use it for inspiration. It's not uh, unprecedented for AOE4 to look at later eras for costume inspiration. Um, more rice hat type designs here. That, that's kind of where I got this this uh, this visual as well. Um, this was generated in Mid Journey, and then I did some photoshopping to add this kind of gun over here and this gun strap. Um, and uh, it's like it's not very accurate as as far as a historical representation of what a Vietnamese uh, gunner would look like, but it does a good job, I think, of capturing the vibe of how I want this faction represented, like, you know, gunners hiding in the jungle, uh, hit and run kind of uh, stealth tactics, 
uh, guerrilla warfare style. Um, and I feel like the characters in this portrait look, at least to me, they look pretty Vietnamese. Uh, and they all kind of have this like rice hat motif, which fits in with some of the later era uh, designs. So I felt like it was fitting enough to, to be used as the uh, cover photo for this for this civilization design. Um, another tiger motif uh, type of helmet for this character. Uh, and yeah, I think this is the famous Vietnamese general that um, won the naval battle against the Mongols, but uh, I don't fully remember. Uh, yeah, that's that's all I want to share about the Vietnamese. All right, well, thank you for listening. Um, let me know what you guys think. Uh, would this be a sieve uh, that you would want to play? I know that it would be a sieve that I would want to play. I fucking love playing the Panzer Elite back in Company of Heroes. I would love to see like mines and uh, kind of like resistance style uh, theming around a civilization. Uh, I think that'd be so sick to add to the game. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's it. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Uh, until the next video, stay frosty, stay chilly.